Tapper DCC, evaluating nine of the best single board computers for SDR and amateur radio starting right now. Hey guys, good afternoon. Welcome to the rain in Yantis, Texas. My name is Jason. I'm KC5HWB. This is Ham Radio 2.0. If this is your first time here, please click on the subscribe button below. Keep up with all the videos we do and uh, all the different topics that we feature on this show. This is the first DCC talk from Albuquerque of uh, 2018 and is uh, given by Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI, and he evaluates nine of the best single board computers for amateur radio to use in SDR. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, I'd like to introduce Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI, and his talk evaluating nine of the best single board computers for modern SDR systems. Take it away, Scott. All right, thanks, Steve. Everybody here okay? Everybody awake? Anybody awake? <laughs> so I'm going to start off uh, the, the technical uh, weekend with something that's not quite so technical and maybe, I mean, you, when I say the best single board computers, okay, that's my opinion. Your opinion may vary. I'm trying to build an SDR system. You might be trying to build something else, and so your mileage may vary. You may have different criteria than I do. So first of all, I want to get started with Q&A. How many people have written any FPGA code? Oh, good, OK. How many know what an FPGA is? OK. Well, then for you guys, you don't need to look at this slide. But this is what an FPGA is, and it's in almost every SDR that we have that uh, in the past oh, 10, 12 years maybe. I should say the best SDRs. And that means you, Phil. Okay, anybody ever written CUDA code? Three maybe? Do you know what CUDA is? Anybody? Okay. A few? Yeah, so you get, get the references here, right? Okay. Well, so this is what CUDA is. For those who don't know what it is, it's basically a graphics core. And uh, it's an NVIDIA graphics core that it, they ship in their, um, in their graphics processors and they, it, they come in arrays, okay? So for instance, the first array that Phil Harmon was using to do his direct Fourier conversion is 192 array. I don't know what the dimensions are, but it's an array of 192 CUDA cores. And he always liked the board. The TK1 board cost 192 bucks, so it was $1 per core. Okay, so now, how many do you own? Okay, I want to know, anybody who has more than five, raise your hand. Okay, more than, more than 10. Jeez, you guys are geeks. More than, tw more than 20. Oh man, 25. Okay, you win. <laughs> However, how many are still in the box? <laughs> Sub subtract them off, you can't count those. This is just like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You gotta turn the thing over and subtract, you know, it's... So, do you still have 25? Okay, how about 20 that are running now, okay? Really? You guys really are geeks. Okay, it's great though. I like to see it. So, since we use monitors a lot, and I'm going to focus on what we're going to use monitors for in the new paradigm that I'm proposing. A little history on monitors. You're supposed to laugh now, it's a cue, right? So, 50,000 BC, this is a monitor lizard, in case you didn't know. A little fast forward, 1862, different kind of monitor. And I want to see how many people get this reference here. Anybody? Okay, here's a hint. Now you get it, right? Okay, hall monitor. Okay, yeah, 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 it's stretch. Everybody knows about this kind. Or this kind. A little small, but all right, otherwise okay. And big curve, giant, unaffordable monitors. And for people like us, in case you've got lots of old monitors sitting around and uh, you've got a welder, you can make something that looks like this. 
But I think more reasonably, that's the modern ham shack that I'm thinking of. And be, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe uh, move the desks further apart, maybe add another one or two. Because I know all you guys, especially the guys with 20 Raspberry Pis running, you got lots of desks, right? They aren't like all sitting on top of each other, all wired. No, okay, I hope not. Okay, so this investigation of monitor history led me to uh, try to compare CPU horsepower and monitor resolution. So here's the eye chart of year resolution. This is the typical CPU that was around at that year, and this is the number of MIPS that particular processor or could execute. Just, you, you do not want to know how long it took me to get all this information off the internet. It's a lot of places. So now as an exercise in total uh, ridiculousness, I divided the number of pixels into the number of MIPS, and you can see this is the result right here, which actually is a relevant correlation. No, not really. But it distracted me from actually having to do the rest of my presentation, so it was all right. Anyway, but it looks like what's happening is uh, processor horsepower is actually increasing faster than pixel resolution, which I guess makes sense because now the monitors are so dense, they're more dense than the eye can perceive, so it really is not going to make much difference whether you go to 4K or 8K or whatever the next highest one is. Okay, so I want to shift gears a little bit. It, it, just th put the monitor in the back of your mind and we'll come back to that. So. A, a narrowband amateur radio SDR system consists of these seven items here. And I try to make them general enough so that they apply to every system. And you can see that if you just pick the system of your choice, pick your ICOM 7300, pick your Flex, pick your uh, HP SDR, whatever you want to pick, you could pretty much take the components and, and divide, <coughs> excuse me, divide them into these categories. I mean, it, it, the software things can be combined, perhaps, but the operation is still necessary. So I'm going to go over these seven things one at a time. The RF portion consists of the hardware. This is hardware now. So this is your antenna feed line, your analog type stuff, bandpass filters, low-pass filters, uh, maybe attenuators or preamps, depending on what band you're on and where you live, how far you live from... KTAR, you know, three miles from a 50,000 watt station, you might need some, some uh, notch filters or something. And then the A to D converter is the last thing. So now this gets you from the ether to digital signals with hardware. And the transmitter is pretty much the same, only reversed. D to A converter, you have filters, buffers, maybe attenuators, depending on how you want to match your power amplifier, and then filters after the power amplifier, and then off to the antenna and feed line. And notice one thing, I don't have any TR switching in here. Because this system I'm proposing is full duplex, there's separate antennas, so there's no, there's no TR switching. So signal processing, the first thing that you do with the data from the A to D converter is typically you have to fit it to the next stage because frankly none of us can listen to all 30 megahertz of the HF spectrum at once, at least I can't. I know you guys are great, you can do it, right? Anybody, can anybody do that? Okay, good. You're honest anyway. Okay, so you, go, you want to listen to a piece, right? You want to listen to SSB, you want to listen to FT8, you want to, you want to do something. Well, not listen to FT8, but you want to operate FT8. So you're going to reduce the bandwidth to fit in the pipe, or in the case of a transmitter, you're going to actually shift up in frequency or increase the bandwidth to send to a DAC. Or you may want to do a frequency to time domain crossing, which should be done in, uh, with signal processing firmware. And this is just math, okay? So it can be done in FPGA hardware, it can be done in CUDA cores, it can be done by your general purpose CPU like your i7. Okay, the pipes is just things that interconnect the pieces. Any kind of pipe, the pipe can connect audio, can connect RF, can connect IQ data, can connect anything. And so there are several kinds of these, like for instance, these are software ones, or direct connects. So for instance, uh, how many have used VAC on Windows? Virtual, virtual audio cable? Well, that's one of these direct connect pipes. It, 
It takes two applications and allows them to talk to each other. With no wires, it's software talking to each other. So you can do, do that with, with actual, they are called pipes, I believe, in software. I'm not a software guy, so you know, pipes are something that I use to take a shower. But, or you could use memory buffers, common buffers, or FIPOs. And they're typically very fast because they don't have to convert to actual physical signals on a wire. Okay, also other hardware, oh, these are hardware pipes now. USB, you're all familiar with that. Ethernet, you're all familiar with that. And I, I use one gigabit Ethernet because that's pretty much the standard nowadays. And I kind of turn my nose up at boards that only have 10100 Ethernet. No Raspberry Pi people got that, did they? Okay. <laughs> yeah. The new one's only 200 megabits or 300 because it hooks to a USB port. Okay, so PCI Express, this is really high speed bus if you want. This is a typical bus. <coughs> Man. Typical bus that you plug your graphics card into in your PC. It's an internal motherboard type bus. And then of course Wi-Fi, 2.45 gigahertz or the new AC, which is 1300, which I'm, when you read on the net, the first thing you see is baloney. It's not 1300, it's more like 600. But that's the spec, so okay, that's theoretical max. You'll never get that. Okay, so modulation, demodulation, the next thing. Oh, thank you. Uh-oh, I just lost my mic. Wow, this feels weird. Ooh, I got a tail. Okay. Okay, so um, modulation, demodulation, where everybody's going to have to have this because if you want to hear anything or if you want to speak and have yourself heard, you're going to need to modulate or demodulate. Even the digital mode, you're going to demodulate it not to sound, but to on digital signals. And since it's software defined, new mode is not even thought of yet. Like FT8, two years ago. What well, didn't exist? Okay, DSP filtering. You know, if you have a flex, you know what this is because you got 250 different bandwidth filters you can choose from. I don't know what the difference is between 50 hertz and 60 hertz filter, but you know, whatever. You got 10 hertz, I know. Somebody had to say that, right? <laughs> it might be minus 10 hertz, depending on what your inertial reference frame is. Okay, so. Also noise gating, whoops, noise gating and uh, redu noise reduction and AGC features that you might want to do in DSP. And then back to analog because you want to hear it if it's a, an audio mode. So you do A to D or D to A conversion depending on whether it's the receive or transmit. Well, on transmit you actually have to do the microphone input so you have to convert that to digital so you can modulate the carrier before you send it back up to the deck which then converts it back to analog to be amplified and sent to the antenna. Sound is typically mono, but so you can do stereo, so you can do like uh, binaural type receivers or um, delay between the ears. That's usually what people say I have, delay between the ears, but uh, makes the sound better, so en enhances things. And you need to put the uh, CW key and the paddle in somewhere so this makes sense where the microphone connects, because it's likely where the user sits in front of the GUI, graphic user interface. So this is all the things you expect on your radio, the pan adapter and waterfall display, how to, how to pick the band and mode, all the controls. And maybe you want to have your logger on the same computer so you don't have to have a separate computer. Maybe you want to run CW skimmer, it'd have to be on the same computer. And interface to monitor, zzz, that's plural. Keyboard and mouse, okay? So, this is a receiver block diagram, so this is, I, I took it as an example, the HP SDR system. And this is maybe uh, the most technical part of the presentation. But I've divided the functions that are in, inside the FPGA. Most of them are, okay, this is not. So here's your RF hardware to get to digital. Then the mixer, low pass filtering, and decimation through a FIFO to Ethernet. So this is all done in the FPGA firmware, this section right here, and then it's converted to Ethernet hardware to talk to the PC that runs the software, which is the next slide. So now here comes the Ethernet pipe in here, another FIFO, 
and then there's two paths here. This one is the narrow band demodulation path, so you can listen to the signal. This is the broad band path, so you can get a pan adapter display and waterfall. It takes the same data in, but it processes it differently. And, and this is not strictly true because this is actually a different format data because you need wider bandwidth than you do on, when you're than when you're demodulating. But so you can see, I broke it up into the same pieces that we had on that first slide, the same seven, sec seven sections. Okay, so where do we draw the line on the components on that diagram? We can move them around. What gets done in hardware? What, what can your PC do? What do you have to have an FPGA for? And you may be asking yourself now, who cares? Hopefully not. But since I care and you're stuck here, we'll talk about it. So a conventional radio, single box, with expanding features of performance. You typically have one, maybe two monitors. Um, you can get multiple virtual receivers. Nobody that I know of yet has done multiple virtual transmitters, but it's, not, it's possible. But it's difficult to accommodate more than one user at a time because you've got limited screen area. You can only fit two chairs in front of two screens. Then what do you do? Look at the back of the monitor. That does, that's not very productive. Dual keyboards, yeah, dueling, dueling keyboards, yeah. So the performance is tied to ever-increasing PC performance, which luckily for us, it is doing that. So even the PCs we can buy today are way ahead of the ones that we had a couple years ago. So this is the highly technical block diagram of the conventional system, which has everything, all of these, all in one box. And maybe you have an external monitor or a tablet to control it, like uh, the Flex Maestro, something like that. But Typically, it's all in here, and the focus is on adding features to this box. And I'm thinking, well, okay, that's great, but there's kind of a limitation because there's only so much screen area, and there's only so many features you can add. Once you get to the re a receiver that has the selectivity and noise floor that are beyond the, the, the static level on the bands, what, how are you going to increase it any? So how about you do something a little different? And I'll get in the next slide, I'll get to um, why I kind of went down this path. But what I'm thinking is many boxes and an ever expanding system, you use a network to expand the system. And with many monitors, so you place a monitor at each operating position and you can utilize the SDR hardware for many users. And you've seen this with remote radios. I think a remote ham radio guys, they have stations that you can rent and you're kind of renting a virtual receiver, okay, at some site with a big antenna that's bigger than you can afford, and, but you get to use it for some low amount of money, some small amount of money compared to putting, <coughs> putting up your own tower. So you're kind of seeing this come about now, and this, it's unlimited user interfaces, and it's really limited by the bandwidth of the pipes that you use to connect it, and somewhat with the hardware, but not nearly as much as you think, and easy to accommodate many users. And then the performance increases with component, like your, your, your user interfaces, your small computers that are in front of every person. So this is more like what I'm thinking. So we have an SDR server which connects to the antenna, Ethernet to a switch, and then you have one, two, three, four, however many clients are connected on the other side of the Ethernet pipe. And each client is a single board computer with its microphone speaker, paddle, display. So these, you can build these for a couple hundred bucks a piece, depending on how much horsepower you need in the SBC. How am I doing on time? Or Steve? Okay. Okay. So the th trick here is these tasks can be moved between, this, this is typically an FPGA, in my opinion, and you can move these tasks into the FPGA to lighten up the load on the single board computers, which by their very definition are not going to be powerful compared to your desktop. However, just look over the past couple years how much more powerful single boards have gotten compared to what they were just a few years ago. The sing some of the ARM processor, many cores, are equivalent to the desktops of only a few years ago. And they cost very little and they consume very little power. 
So the idea is, and I'll talk about latency in a little bit, but uh, the problem is you've got to do all the signal processing and it takes time. A, a diode mixer takes nanoseconds, but a DSP algorithm takes time to execute and it depends on, is it on hardware and FPGA, very fast, or is it on a PC, slower, or on a single board computer, very slow. So you may end up wanting to move some of these operations up to the server and get them out of the way of the user. So the inspiration for this, and I actually thought of this idea before Zach Lau did, but he, he actually did it, so you have to give credit to the guy who actually does it, not the person that thinks of it, right? Otherwise, all of us would be rich because we all thought of things that are mainstream now that, well, never mind. Okay. So, Zach Lau actually did this. He started with a bag of parts at 11 a.m., that's mountain time, on field day, the start of the contest, and he started soldering. And then he said, okay, how many QSOs can I make starting with solder and parts and ending up with the field day station? And he actually got the thing working and made some QSOs on field day using this method. So, not being a diehard as much as that is, I thought, well, okay, the field day st setup we're using now is using 30-year-old radios. And I'm thinking, well, okay, what would a state-of-the-art station be like instead of using 30-old Kenwoods? What would it be like if we applied SDR to a field day setup? So here's a field day setup that, that is the, my dream field day setup. And I need, this needs a little bit of explanation. The idea here, and this is, this is not going to happen in one year for field day. This is a thing that's going to evolve over time, but this is the goal here. The idea is that you put the transmitter and receiver on the, at the feed point of the antennas, and you put them separate, separated by enough physical distance that you don't overload the receiver with the transmitter. You run Cat5 and power up the tower, hook it to an Ethernet switch, and these are the users down here who all have single board computers, monitors, they're running their uh, radio software. So, and of course, you know what, I tell you, in Arizona, the first question that I get asked when I explain this, how are you going to keep that cool? Because it's going to be up in the sun at 120 degrees, so you have to, you'll have to deal with that problem. But I, I tell them that's an implementation detail. We don't worry about that. <laughs> Think, I think maybe all of this is an implementation detail, but anyway, so the idea is you put the rig up here so there's no coax feed line. We've already done this with the, pardon me, with the receiver, with virtual receivers. It receives all 30 megs at a time. It slices off a little piece for however many users you have and sends that down. So one guy can be on 40 PSK, another can be on 40 CW, another can be on 40 SSB at the same time. And really, if you think about this, why can't you do this with the transmitter? It's just DSP. A 40 meter and a 20 meter signal together is just a different waveform than a 40 meter signal by itself. So, the, I mean, there's a lot of details to be ironed out, like uh, the guys who design satellite transponders will tell you this, how do you share the carrier power between, oh, nine guys all press their key at the same time versus everybody listening? So you have, you have to deal with that kind of problem because you can't just change the amplitude with every key press because then you get real nice AM modulation on top of your CW or SSP. Okay, so the SBCs. This is probably what you're all waiting for and I haven't talked at all about them yet. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Okay, so the SBC asks as a client to the SDR server hardware, so the idea is it's a single server multi-client, but it doesn't have to be a single server because you could have a tri-bander with, with a receiver and SDR hardware and a 8040 dual band dipole with another radio and you could feed them both onto the same network. And then each user would say, oh, I want the stream from the 40 meter radio. Oh, I want the stream from the 20 meter radio. Oh, by the way, I want to see if 10's open. Pop me up on a window and show me the band on 10 while I'm operating on 40. All this is doable. And the thing is that you don't run out of real estate. 
because you open up as many windows as you as one user can use, and but there are many windows available, so you can support many users. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the, the SBC provides the graphical user interface and the connection point for the hardware, like your microphone, paddle, and all that. And it's also not very expensive, because it's not a high performance system. It's also low power. Okay, so the requirements for an SBC for this kind of use, these are the requirements that I put forth. Yours may differ, but I want mainstream Linux support, and I have a couple on my list that don't really have mainstream Linux support because they're ARMs and they're used for Android development. So I really don't want to develop, I don't want to port a package to my particular board. I want, I want to be able to go to the manufacturer's website and download an image because I got enough things to do without messing with Linux and trying to compile it and, and that. Not that all of you guys couldn't do that, but it's like, do you want to go mine the lead or do you want to use the pencil? That's, I, I, want to, I got other things that are more, more fun than building Linux. So gigabit ethernet, no 10100 if I can avoid it. HDMI video, uh, solid state boot media too. I don't want any rotating magnetic devices in my system. Except maybe the chair I sit on. That they can go around. And sound hardware, either native or via USB. Some of the boards don't have sound, so you have to add it with USB. And obviously a keyboard and mouse connection. And you can use Bluetooth for that, but I think as I point here, not for audio. As, how many people have tried Bluetooth with audio on Morse code? I know there's at least one person here because I've, I've talked to, yeah, it doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> the latency is too much. Now, it, yeah, okay, you could fight with that and maybe you could get the latency down, but you know, wires are cheap and so just plug into the board. So, 64-bit core, preferable. Um, I like, some boards have 12 volt power, and when I say 12 volt, I mean like wideband, like 11 to 15. So you can run it on, off a battery. And you can run it off a battery while you're charging it with solar panels. Okay, so these are the nine boards that I picked. And I tell you, I went to a, a um, single board computer website. There were 279 boards listed on their website. And I'm going like, oh. I mean, it's obviously it's from Beagle boards all the way up through Pentiums, but it's daunting when you look at the number of boards. So I spent hours, fun hours, but researching, well, which ones are the best ones? Which ones are the best? Pretty much, I have one board that's over 300 bucks. None of the other ones are. Most of them are between one and 200 or below 100. But these are the processors that are in them. This is the manufacturer of the chip. Now what you find with ARM cores is there are about 50 different varieties of ARM cores. And when you say, oh, look, uh, let's say an A53. So you go to the ARM page and say, what's an A53? Well, is that better than an A72 or than an A73? Well, all they tell you is, well, it can run anywhere between 1.1 and 2 gigahertz, and it can have between 8K and 32K of cache per core. And now it's, it's tunable by the manufacturer of the part. So when I say there's a particular core, you got to say what kind of speed it runs at because that's what the manufacturer picked. And I'll get to the cache and all that later, but everyone's different. So you can't just say, oh, it's an A72. That means it runs at this speed. That means it has this much cache. You can't do that. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the specs of what makes these Unique is things like out of order execution or look ahead branches or things like that. And I can't possibly go into which one's better and which one's worse in this amount of time, let alone even figure it out myself. So what I rely, relied on was, well, generally faster clock's better, right? More performance, faster clock. More cache is better, right? Higher speed memory bus is better, right? So that's kind of what I focused on as, a, as an easy, uh, ordering. And these are roughly ordered, and all these charts have these in the same order. These are roughly ordered from lowest performance to highest performance. And as you'll see, amazingly, the cost comes out lowest to highest, pretty close. So this is, a, is the uh, lazy man summary of what the cores are in the nine boards that I use. Reds are 32K, 32-bit 32 buses. 
black 64-bit. And generally the way I did it is I said, okay, well, the more level one cache and the more level two cache you got, the better. But generally, too, the more recent the year, the better, because newer ones are faster and better, because otherwise, why would they bring them out? I'll just use an old one if, it, if it's better. And then these are the boards that use these particular cores. And you notice there's some overlap, because every one of these is multi-core, and they have combinations of these to do more mundane housekeeping tasks versus what? Uh, okay. Um, okay, it may, it may be. This is extremely hard to do because you have to go to 50 different websites to find this because they'll say, oh yeah, it uses these cores. Well, what's, how much cash? Oh, they don't tell you that. Oh, by the way, you have to get the data sheet to see that and you can't get that without an NDA. So then you have to go to the forum and hope some guy accidentally tells you how many, uh, how many K it is. So it, it becomes difficult. So it could be that I made a mistake there. I'll go back and look. Okay, this is the graphics processor. I didn't focus too much on this because the graphic capability is not very uh, demanding in this application. But you can see generally higher performance, higher frequency. And you can kind of look at the numbers the, the letter and number are the newest ones, so this has the newest version of the cores, of the GPUs. Okay, as far as memory goes, this is, uh, is what they have, and again, typically, higher performance is either more or faster, or both memory. And also, this is the critical part here. What do you boot from? This, and the, this is a slow boot, this is a faster boot, and uh, where's the MVME? MVME, is this, this is actually, I believe, the fastest. Yeah. And of course, it depends on the drive you put in and all that, but in general, micro SD card is not the way I would like to boot. I'd like to boot with something onboard. And you can see some of them have onboard in red. Okay, so everybody does micro SD card, but some of them have onboard faster interfaces on board memory. And some of them have sockets, so you can pick the size of memory you want. Okay, ports, the usual suspects. You're gonna need several of whatever type these. You typically, you don't need USB 3 ports. I mean, you don't need that for sound or a mouse or a keyboard, but they're there, so you can use them if you need to. And they all have HDMI ports. Some of them even have USB-C ports, which is amazing. And only one of them has 100 meg Ethernet, which has now been taken care of with the 3B Plus. And they have gig Ethernet, but it, it hooks to a USB port. So you're still limited to two or 300 meg. And then these have no, US, no uh, Ethernet. You have to use a USB dongle to uh, get Ethernet. And more I.O., whether they have Bluetooth this, so that you could use keyboards. And I'm not really, I think the jury's out on Bluetooth peripherals because I've talked to people who've used Bluetooth keyboards and mice and they're flaky. They tend to disconnect by themselves and the last thing you need is in the middle of a contest to have your keyboard disconnect and then have you fool around with trying to get it to reconnect again. Uh, Wi-Fi generally don't care because I, Wi-Fi is good if you're sitting in your office and you want to upgrade the kernel or something, and you want to load something, and you don't want to go mess around with a cable. But generally, I, I would do wired Ethernet for a real station. And then here's your power. And you can see, the, again, the more expensive boards tend to have more ubiquitous power supplies, more wide range. And then sound, some of them have output only, like just a headphone. That's it. They don't have a microphone. One of them has an onboard microphone, so you can say, hello, radio. Okay, I don't think you really want to do that for your contest, but you could mount the radio on the end of the boom like this, right? And, never mind. Okay, and now operating system support, and you notice down here these are blank because I really couldn't find any image online. I think they exist, but I really ran out of time, and it, it takes a lot of digging just to come up with this. And maybe one of you Linux guys can explain this to me. On 
The hard kernel page, they have 1804 LTS Ubuntu, and this is the kernel that they claim that they use. But now you go down here, and this is the kernel they claim you use. Now, I don't understand how you can have two different kernels on the same version of Ubuntu. So maybe somebody who has more knowledge than I do can explain that to me. Okay, so you can see most of the, the mainstream ones use standard version of Linux. So that's what I like because, again, I, I'm going to have enough fight with the software that runs on Linux, let alone fighting with the operating system. Okay, so here's the costs, which I'm sure you've all been waiting for with holding your breath. And you see, it does go kind of in order. There's a few anomalies that are out of order. And the box I drew around here is my interpretation of the most optimum ones that I would pick, because I think they're the most bang for the buck. And you notice that there's only one over 100 bucks. But before you get too excited, beware, because I think... Uh, and I forget which one it is, but by the time you get it out the door with the MMC memory card, oh, well, that's right, the Wi-Fi card is that's an accessory, and oh yeah, and you add all the parts up, and it's like 200 bucks, and it looked like it was a $79 board, but by the time you bought all those extra pieces, it ends up costing you a lot more. Like the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, that's five bucks. Go on eBay and see what the the kits that have all the parts in them cost 30 bucks. So you're not getting away with anything. Okay. So now, given that, well, how did I decide which one, which one is going to be adequate? Are they, is it going to work or is it not going to work? So it has to run the required software. So that may, in fact, let the higher end ones out. If I can't get a Linux image that I, and I don't want to fight with building one, then I'm just not going to pick that single board computer. When you run it, you can fire up CPU performance monitors and see, well, are all the cores pegged? Well, if they are, this is probably not, there's probably you got to do something about that because you're not going to get a responsive systems, system. And when you lose IQ data, you get pops and crackles. So if the board can't keep up, then you're going to get, uh, you're going to hear it. And if you can hear it, lots of things happen that you can't hear, but pops and crackles, by the time you hear them, you have a problem. And how do your pan, pan adapter and waterfall displays update? Do they kind of jerk? Do they flow smoothly? Uh, take your pan adapter, uh, take your waterfall and turn the speed up. Does it, fall, does, it, does it work or does it choke when you turn the speed up? The other thing, go in, if the DSP is done in the uh, SBC, go put your narrow CW filter in. It takes more cycles to do a narrow CW filter than a wide one. And we have a Raspberry Pi in the other room, in the demo room, a Pi 3, running John Melton's Lin HPSDR software, and running a Linear, not Linear, a Raspbian Linux. And if you go in there and you turn the noise blanker on, it locks up. It, it can't do it. It can't hear. And then the problem is, you can't turn it off because the mouse doesn't respond anymore. And then when you turn it off, when you turn the power off and turn it back on, it comes back up on. Ask me about that later. Okay, so does the GUI remain responsive? And then is the latency acceptable? The latency is, the, my definition is, how much time does it take from RF to audio or audio to RF or both combined? So, funny you should ask, what's acceptable latency? Well, CW 30 words a minute, a dot is 40 milliseconds. So you might say, okay, well, that means I better have 30 milliseconds maximum latency or I won't be able to hear in between my dots. Well, that's not true. And so you've had lots of discussions about this. What Because what happens is, imagine this, what, well, as starters, first of all, it's going to be greater than five milliseconds. So even for phone, you can't use side tone. You can't listen to your own receiver as a side tone. It does not work. The delay is too great. So you have to locally generate side tone, that is microphone in your ear or paddle data, you know, the, the keyer data coming back out. It's got to be locally generated. So what happens then on CW is you've got your paddle and your speaker here. Imagine you're sitting in front of your radio. Every time you hit the dit or the da, you instantly get a dit or you get a tone coming out of the speaker. So it blanks the receiver and you get the tone. Now when you let up, so, so what remains? 
for you to listen to the receiver. What time remains? Well, the spaces in between your dits, right? Your, your local dits. Well, now suppose your receiver, or suppose your transmitter takes 100 milliseconds to actually transmit. That means that when you let up your paddle and you go back to receive, what the receiver's going to hear is what the transmitter, what, what you sent 100 milliseconds ago. Right? So what you've got is this overlap of what I'm sending now versus what I sent in the past, and it's an or of them, and when either one is true, you have to blank the receiver, because I, I can't hear the guy I'm talking to when I'm transmitting. Even if I'm full duplex, I can't do that. So what you want, and that'll confuse you if you hear what you were sending 200 milliseconds ago in the speaker, that you don't want to do that. So you have to blank the receiver during the actual paddle down time, and also during the time that the, that the transmitter is sending. A little complicated to uh, comprehend. So anyway, this is my idea of the benchmark for a receiver, is you start out with t equals zero, you close the key, and you measure the time it takes until you actually hear the audio output of your CW note. And less is better, but I think the jury's out as to actually how much latency is acceptable. And then for the transmitter, whoops, wrong way. The transmitter is the same thing in the opposite direction. T equals zero when you hit the key. T equals the latency time when you get RF out of the antenna. And really, you have to add both of these together if, if, for the user experience on your end because the, the other guy's gonna hear your signal after the transmit latency, and then he's gonna come back immediately, and then you're gonna hear him after your receive latency. So you've got both of those to deal with. So this is really the hardest problem right here to solve, I think. And past uh, receiver transmitters have not done that very well. Pardon me? I have not, and that's what I wanted to Repeat say. Repeat the question. Oh. Have I done any measurements on this? No, uh, the old receivers that I've measured have been in the 50 to 100 millisecond range, which I think I view as unacceptable. And I've asked Phil Harmon on his DFC what he, kind of measurement he's made, and he hasn't made any measurements yet. So this is kind of a work in progress, and I mean, it's, it's loads of fun to play with hardware and try to set it up and get it to work the way you want. And so uh, I guess look for another presentation, either at Dayton or next year, on some results of, of the testing. Questions? Real quick questions, and wait for the microphone to come to you. So some of this stuff has already been resolved through audio processing and MIDI and all those guys. You know, have you looked at doing like a MIDI type protocol for CW? No, I haven't. That's that's a good idea. How does? It, how, can I ask you a question real quick? What? How does the latency look? It's it's very low, right? I yeah, it's extremely low. They've got a time code protocol that's embedded into it, and um, they actually um, have done some testing with uh, concert pianos where they can actually, it actually grabs a lot more data than is capable to be produced by a keyboard. Okay. So. There was one more over here. Um, have you looked at Red Hawk? Uh, it's an older uh, framework for distributed SDRs. Um, it's a little old and dated right now. I don't think it got a lot of traction uh, when it was created, but it has some interesting features for doing distributed uh, SDR support. Okay, what's it called? Red Hawk SDR. Red Hawk? Yeah, it's available up off of uh, GitHub. So if you go to, um, uh, I have the URL here. Okay, well, get with me afterward. I'm, I'm interested you, in talking yeah, to you, you about it. Yeah, if you it up. Um, yeah. it's, it's interesting in that it's already solved some of the problems that you're talking about. Okay. And it interfaces to things like RF knock if you want to go that advanced. Okay, thanks. Yeah, real quick. Um, Scotty over here. Oh. Um, so at Haystack, <laughs> we have not been able to implement a lot of this stuff mainly because the boards disappear in three years. We had the whole Intel Edison platform pulled out from under us when Intel just decided, well, we're not going to do that architecture anymore. How do we, you can't completely insulate yourself against that on these SBCs that you mentioned, but it's something to remember. Well, it's that good, you have to try to guess which ones are going to be around for a while. Well, not necessarily. It's a good question, but if you look at the hard kernel webpage, they're guaranteeing production dates for their processors for at least five years. 
And so now is that enough five years? I don't know, but but it's better than like you said tomorrow I go to buy one of these boards It's my favorite board and I can't buy it anymore So do you have time for another one more quick from no. I was just going to make a comment along those lines um, Thanks for a very nice presentation, but yeah, we're also working with these uh, Versalogic Raven boards which are guaranteed for a certain amount of time They're cold tested, but a big problem with them is they're a lot more expensive So you're looking at like fifteen hundred dollars for a full kit yeah. versus like 200 bucks. So yeah. there's a trade off. It's a trade off. Yeah. Okay. Phil Karn's got one, and then we'll take that as the last question. Okay. Yeah, just to comment on this availability thing. Uh, I mean, the only way around it I see is just to go for generic functionality, you know, a, a single board computer with all the standard interfaces, some standard version of Linux, some processor mm -hmm. that's been around for a long time. There's no other way to do it. Uh, I mean, I think the Raspberry Pi would be around for a while. It's certainly, yeah. it's like now number three computer of all time now. Uh, but if you start using special features, that's, that's where you get yourself in trouble. Yeah, I, mean, and, I, and I actually think twice about using special instructions, even though they're probably going to be around longer than the, the actual board. Well, and you notice there's nine boards. And yeah. I have, if you've got, in the demo room, I have all nine of these, so you can go look at them. The idea is that they're supposed to be interchangeable, so that and I can are, make... Are they really in practice, is the question. I'm asking. Right, right. Yeah. That's a good... Yeah. That's, okay. that's the Let's, goal, anyway. We need Thank to you. wrap it up. Thank you very much, Scotty. This has been Ham Radio 2.0, a YouTube production by KC5HWB. Visit our website at www.livefromthehamshack.tv. Please also stop by our Facebook page at fb.me slash hamradio2. Be sure and subscribe here on YouTube to keep up with all the new videos that are posted nearly every Monday. 73 is everyone, and thanks for watching.